Hey, we want to let you in on a secret. You can innovate. A gym teacher needed a sport to play indoors during winter months. A blind teenager needed a system for reading. A student kept forgetting his flash drive. Notice a pattern? Innovation often starts with real people solving their own problems, innovating for their own use. This is User Innovation. Believe it or not, it's all around you. Sports, medicine, software, food, you name it. But how do you become a user innovator? How do you get your idea out into the world? To answer these questions, we'll take a look at real-world examples. Interview people like you who solve their own problems. And meet MIT professor Eric Van Hippel, who pioneered the study of user innovation. When we started working on our MOOCs, I had to learn a lot about filmmaking. For example, how are we getting this shot? This innovation is called the Steadicam. The Steadicam is a camera stabilization system that allows the camera operator freedom of motion while maintaining a smooth shot. It's risen! Shots like this are possible! Before the invention of the Steadicam, if you were a filmmaker and wanted to move the camera smoothly, you had to use a dolly. Dollies were heavy and were particularly difficult to use if you were filming outside. The uneven terrain meant using dolly tracks, which had to be laid out like a miniature railroad. Filmmaker Garrett Brown was tired of having to use such bulky, time-consuming equipment to get the shot he wanted. He wanted the ease of operating a handheld camera and the steadiness of using a dolly. That led him to experiment with a way to create a wearable camera stabilization system. By the mid-70s, Garrett had a working prototype that he wanted to sell to camera manufacturers, so he created a demo reel of several shots that had previously been impossible and sent it to Hollywood. In 1974, Garrett sold his invention to the Cinema Products Corporation, who created the first professionally manufactured, commercially available version of the Steadicam. Prominent Hollywood directors began to contact Garrett and Cinema Products, wanting to employ the Steadicam in their films. Major Hollywood productions such as Marathon Man, Rocky, and The Shining were some of the first films to use a Steadicam and created intense demand for the device. Soon, the Steadicam was everywhere. Filmmaking was never the same. Come film with us, Erdeen. Come film with us forever and ever and... Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, but first, Garrett Brown's example should make us wonder, why do people decide to sell the innovations? Meet Phil and Chris, two musicians who write and play music in a band. When recording in the studio, Phil and Chris pay an audio engineer to edit and finalize their recorded music. They listen closely to every detail and ask the engineer to make changes. The results are great, but 
they have to pay for every minute of studio time they spend reviewing and discussing. Creativity takes time, and time equals money. Phil and Chris were left with a dilemma. Pay a lot of money to get the quality they want, or sacrifice quality for low cost. This choice was unacceptable. So, the musicians innovated. Guys, I love your music, and I also love the fact that you're entrepreneurs. You're the founders of a startup, Audio Common. How did it all come together? My wife and I, we moved to Massachusetts, and shortly thereafter, we found ourselves at a block party. Uh, I had heard there was a drummer on the street. Chris and I met at that block party. Yeah, we started talking. Uh, you know, Phil said he was a musician, singer, songwriter, and uh, you know, he needed someone to play drums on, on a couple of his songs. So he sent me two songs. Those two turned into like 10 or 12 songs. <laughs> Give him uh, a finger, <laughs> take the elbow. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I really, really love the music. And, and uh, so we decided to go into the studio and record. So guys, let me understand this a little better. You go into the music studio together and you come out entrepreneurs. <laughs> what happened there? How did it all come together? So after recording our music in the studio, we entered into the mixing phase of the process. And in the mixing phase, that's where you assign individual volumes and effects to each of the multiple tracks that make up the final polished piece of music. So that's the individual tracks that make up a final song. The, the individual bass, drums, guitar, synthesizer, whatever instruments were used in the creation of that song. And this portion of the process is very tedious and typically there's a lot of revisionary work that happens between the studio engineer and the musicians who are actually paying for the studio time as they give comments to the engineer and the I engineer see. produces different mixes. And we found ourselves spending way more time in the studio than we had anticipated and of course spending a lot of time in the studio means you're burning a lot of money as an independent musician you're typically self-funding your projects and what have you. That sounds like a bummer, I gotta say. Exactly, yeah, you're, you're, you're paying every minute you're in the studio, so it's really kind of this, this study and compromise because you wanna spend a lot of time, you know, kind of perfecting your art, but, you know, every minute you're there, you're yeah. spending you're money. On the clock, right? You're on the clock, so. Yeah. Every decision you make is really a compromise. And it's totally, in my eyes, it's totally detrimental to the creative process. The studio should be this great creative atmosphere, and when you're on the clock watching the money just fly out of your pockets, it's really hard to get into that important creative groove. So, we really, we identified this process, reviewing mixes and what have you, and, and Chris and I were saying to ourselves, while we were in the studio just kind of blowing this money, saying there, there should be a way to do at least a portion of this process at home, yeah. namely that key review portion of the process. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that, that has to feel terrible if you're a musician, you really care about your music and you feel like, ah, if it's not 100%, I, uh, I would be frustrated, I gotta tell you. Yeah, we figured if we're having this problem, other people are having the same problem. Um, we talked to other musicians, they were running into the same issues that we were. And we figured, uh, you know, I have a programming technological background. I'm passionate about music. Phil's passionate about music and he has a business background. So we really have the core that can, you know, take this to the next step and maybe start a company. And it's great. Only a couple years later, we're sitting here not only as bandmates and really close friends, but also as 
founders of a company called Audio Common. Let's take a look at their innovation, Audio Common. Phil and Chris wanted to reduce the time they spent in the studio. So they decided to develop an affordable online platform that allows musicians to create a profile, upload tracks, invite bandmates, and collaborate on their own time and outside the studio. Eric, good to see you already. I love doing this. I got to spend some time with Phil and Chris of Audio Common. Yeah. And unlike Daria, who diffuses her innovation peer to peer, mm. these guys are diffusing the innovation with the market. Yep. I wonder, what do you think about this choice? I think it's a fabulous choice. The point is, we have to understand that user innovators have choices. Well, cool. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Okay. What kind of choices? Well, start at the beginning. You're a user innovator. You're solving your problem for yourself. That's right. When you have solved it for yourself, it's fabulous. You have something of value, right? Now, at that point, you could decide to stop. You're done. You've solved you got your what problem. you need. Got what you need. Uh, I can relate to that. I mean, on our team, we constantly come up with user innovation ideas because we run into problems. But yeah. we love what we do. Yeah. We want to keep going. There's no reason for us to do anything else. And okay. Yeah. But along the way, you may say to yourself, whoa, this could have value to others as well. Right? It doesn't have value to others as well, then forget it. You know, there's no sense trying to go on. If it does have value to others as well, then you can say to yourself, well, maybe I should diffuse it. And then you're asking, well, all right, how? Peer to peer, via the market? Yeah. And so as you're asking it, what should you be thinking about? What are the characteristics of this product? Can it go peer to peer? Can it go also commercial? And which one do I prefer? So let's take Daria. Daria discovered that there was a demand for temperature data, right? But she was in a position where she wanted to be a professional oceanographer and continue to do so. She could also have started a company selling temperature data. Yeah. Probably didn't even occur to her, but she could have. And the reason it probably didn't occur to her is that she wanted to be an oceanographer. Hmm. She didn't want to start a company. Now, let's take the guys from AudioCommon, right? They developed software for themselves. They could have just used that software and spent the rest of their time in music, yeah. but they decided, no, I want to start a company. I want to go for the fences. Yeah, these guys wanted to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. So that's fabulous, good choice, why not? All right, I'm diffusing via the market. What other choices do you have then? So there Phil and Chris are, and they're in the position of having a community. That is fabulous, fellow artists. They can, at the beginning of their process, share their innovations with others and see if it's what the others want as well. Yeah. So they can refine their product to make it good for everybody, not just for themselves. Yeah, it's a very seamless process. Yeah, seamless. Yeah. Easy, talk to your community today, fix it tomorrow, go back and forth. They're your friends, they're your community. And when you're finished, and they like it, mm -hmm. they already know about it. You can easily sell it to them. Yeah, well, let me ask you this. You know, your community can only take you so far. Yeah. and. Are you saying that if you're a user innovator, you're pretty much locked into having a community-oriented company of users who are quite like you, mm -hmm. and that company is unlikely to go bigger than that? Is, mm -hmm. is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, locked in is the wrong way to think about it. There are many people who start community, lifestyle companies, make a perfectly good income, and focus on the needs of people just like themselves. Yeah. It's true it can limit the company, yeah. but it depends what they're after in life. Maybe they decide, no, I want to build further and build a big company. Then you have to learn the needs of the mass market. 
then it's no longer serving just people like yourself. And you probably have to be open to adapting, changing your innovation. Yeah. The needs of the mass market may differ from their own personal needs and the needs of their community. And then they have to be sensitive to adapting to mass market needs. No reason they can't do it, just as a big company can, but they have to be aware of it. Garrett Brown made a somewhat different choice. Mm -hmm. He licensed the technology. So he figured out there was demand. You remember he put out a real film? Yeah. And everybody said, whoa, I want one of those, yeah. right? But all he had was sort of a crummy prototype. Not crummy, but I mean, it wasn't like really professional. So he could license it. Why would he do that? Because that way, he can keep on making movies. He doesn't have to become a yeah. company owner. So he licenses it. He consults a bit for the company that he licenses yeah. it to. He gets a better product. Yeah. And he also makes money from selling it. Yeah, licensing revenues. Again, yeah. he didn't have to do that. He could have just kept his prototype for himself. But he chose to. It's an option that's open to him. When we talk about choices, I want to address this uh, quintessential fear that I think a lot of people have. Yeah. The fear that, hey, why even bother innovating yeah. when some yeah. big guy, big company can come around and yeah. just eat your lunch? Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk about yeah, that. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Big companies are not so scary for two reasons. One is uh, you, as a user entrepreneur, know your market better than they do. The other is that you, as a user entrepreneur, are typically serving a small and emerging market that may grow. Mm. Big companies don't like small and emerging markets. Not even on their radar in the beginning. No, they want yeah. to serve big markets that are established and stable. So they won't be interested in the beginning. And you can use that time to grow and gain strength. So take the time you have. Use it well, and you can beat the big companies. This is a great message for yeah. user innovators. Yeah. You got choices, you got advantages, blaze your own path. Absolutely. Eric, thank you. Pleasure. Now, let's check back in with Phil and Chris to see what kind of company they want to build. Phil, Chris, you've experienced a frustrating problem and decided to start Audio Common. Why do you think? In your case, starting a company was a great way to solve the problem. We want to fix the problem for ourselves, but we want to have a large impact on the music industry. We know that we can fix this problem for the music industry as a whole, and in doing so, empower artists and new generations of music creators to come, and that's really exciting for us. Couldn't you have given away your innovation for free, peer-to-peer? -peer? Why start a for-profit company? Man's got to eat. Yeah, I mean, we'd love to give it away for free, but we have hosting costs, development costs, licensing. Uh, you know, we have to pay our bills, too. And to me, it's, it's a noble thing to have something free and open source, but um, you really shouldn't ever, I think, be shy about capturing the value that you've created in society. And this is a very important tenant, I think, to business as a whole. It's that there are two equal parts of the equation. One, it's create value for society and for your, for your customer base, et cetera. But then it's also capture that value so that you can better serve that customer base that you're trying, that you're trying so hard to serve. That's how you build and you grow a sustainable company uh, that serves its customer base extremely well. Speaking of serving a constituency, you are coming up against established players with a lot of resources, technology companies, record labels, who potentially could be in a much better position to serve your constituency now. But as you look at it, what advantages might you have? I, I've worked at some larger companies, and in my experience, uh, it's a lot harder for them to adapt to new technologies. It's the proverbial Titanic trying to turn. Um, we're a much smaller company, we're very agile, um, you know, and we can really react to what our, our customers need and really turn on a dime. Uh, we have a firm position on Boston's indie rock, indie artist scene. That gave us the chance to actually reach out to the artists we know and get the early feedback that we needed that was so important to our product and especially those early versions of the product. 
Now, does this mean that you guys want to focus on your very specific community of independent indie rock artists? Or you want to kind of go big or go home, have a highly scalable global enterprise that serves a mass market? We want to build a large, sustainable, scalable enterprise that can have a huge worldwide impact on music and media. Cool. How? We're building constituency by giving artists the ability to share those raw multi-track files that were used during the music creation process with the public. So the band can share the music with their fans through our platform and they're sharing more than just the song. They're they're sharing the building blocks of that song. Like the so, guitar track, the drum track, the piano track. Exactly. So if I really like a guitar solo, I can solo that track and hear it um, all, you know, all on its own. And now through AudioCom, the public can tap in, can play around by turning on and off these individual tracks, and they can forge a new and deeper connection with the artists behind the music itself. Yeah, so I'm not just listening, I can also see how the music that I love from my favorite band, how this music could be different, how you can change it up here and there, right? That's exactly right. So you're telling me musicians from different parts of the world could come together online, create music, and fans like me can enjoy that music. We want to swing for the fences and create as much impact and change in the industry that we can, and we want to empower artists and content creators throughout the world as best we can. And we're doing that through Audio Common. So, what did we learn here today? User innovators have a lot of choices when it comes to diffusion. You can keep it for yourself, give it away, or sell it. If you choose to sell, you can license your innovation or produce it yourself. If you choose to produce, you can serve your initial community of users or adapt your innovation and expand your user community. However you choose to build your business, user innovators have advantages over large companies if they use their time and resources wisely. But most importantly, you as a user innovator have many choices. Make the best ones for you and your life. Solve your problem, share your solution, start your business. Yeah!